Not guilty, declared the judge, thus acquitting the defendant of murder and arson charges in the final fifth trial, and leaving the case unsolved without managing to identify the true perpetrator, even after a protracted legal saga spanning over eight years. Today's episode looks into one of South Korea's most controversial, unsolved crime cases filled with unexpected twists and turns and known, rightly or wrongly, as the country's version of the O.J. Simpson trial. Around 8.45 a.m. on June 12, 1995, white smoke started to billow from a unit in an apartment building in Seoul, the capital city of South Korea. A security guard tried to contact the homeowner on the intercom, but no one answered. At around 9.07 a.m., he and his co-workers pray open a security window grill, entered, and saw flames spiring out of the master bedroom. Firefighters soon extinguished the fire, which had started in the bedroom wardrobe and had not spread much beyond the initial point of ignition. The firefighters soon made a shocking discovery, the bodies of 30-year-old Trey and her two-year-old daughter in the bathtub filled with warm water. The husband, Lee, a 33-year-old surgeon, had already gone to his private practice, whose opening was slated for that very day. The mother had a bruise on the inside of her lower lip, blood stain on the nail of her left index finger, and abrasions on her shoulders. Her top was off, underwear pulled down to her knees, and she had clear marks of strangulation on her neck. Her daughter's neck also displayed marks of strangulation with a cord. The front door was locked from the inside. There was no sign of force entry. The apartment was not ransacked, and nothing was missing, including jewelry and cash in the victim's purse, making robbery seem unlikely. Police soon learned that Trey, a dentist with her own clinic, had been having a long-term affair with another man, an interior decorator, whom she met while her husband was serving in the military as a public health doctor in another city. 18 to 21 months of military service is compulsory for all physically fit South Korean males aged between 18 and 35. Women are not required to perform military service, but they may voluntarily do so. According to the clinic staff, she often met the man and carried on her extramarital affair with him in her office, and the police found her diary in which she even wrote, I thought of him even when I was sleeping with my husband. This led the police to view Lee, the husband, as the culprit from the start, believing he had ample motive for committing the crime if he had discovered that his wife was cheating on him. However, he claimed that he'd never had the slightest suspicion that his wife was unfaithful, and only learned about it from the police. However, there was quite a bit of suspicious indirect evidence pointing to his guilt. The husband had fingernail marks on his arm, which he claimed were left when he clenched his arm tightly. Upon learning about the deaths of his wife and daughter, and was not allowed to enter his home, the police, on the other hand, believed they were the marks left by the victim's fingernails, but he was strangling her with a cord. Even so, they committed a grave error of not having the marks examined by a doctor and compared against the victim's fingernails. His lawyer later submitted photos of him reenacting the action of clenching his arm, which left a similar shape of the original fingernail marks. The police also found a suspicious note in a pair of Lee's sweatpants, Written on it was Single White Female, the title of a 1992 psychological thriller featuring a scene of blood-stained clothes being burned in an incinerator and another of an attack victim in a bathtub. Lee, however, stated that he could not even recall the title or ever watching this movie. To verify the truth, the police went to the city where he had previously worked as a public health doctor, found a video rental shop near his former address, and learned he had rented this movie not once but twice. Lee failed to pass a polygraph test, and the police became convinced of his guilt. Lee maintained his innocence, but was arrested on the 2nd of September 1995 on charges of murder and arson. The exact time of the victim's deaths emerged as the biggest issue of contention in the trial. The defendant had left for work at around 7 that morning, and was confirmed to have arrived at his private hospital about an hour later. He was most likely the killer if the victims were killed before seven, but if later, it would mean someone else had broken into the apartment without leaving signs of forced entry and committed the crime during the span of two hours between when Lee left for work and when the security guard discovered the fire. 
prosecution contended that the defendant quarreled with his wife, murdered her and the daughter, whom he suspected was not his child, in the early hours of the morning, and set fire to the wardrobe, just before leaving for work at 7. They presented the results of a computer simulation, showing that it takes more than two hours for the smoke to be detected from outside, when clothes are set on fire in a wardrobe inside a closed room. They also presented testimonies from three of the country's leading forensic scientists, who estimated the time of death to be before 7 a.m., based on the signs of postmortem lividity, which refers to dark purplish discoloration of the skin caused by the pooling of blood after the heart stops beating, and the progression of rigor mortis, or the stiffening of muscles, which they believed indicated that seven or eight hours had passed since the victim's deaths. According to the autopsy results, some traces of the food the family had for dinner the previous evening remained in the victim's stomach. But there was nothing of the breakfast Lee told the police that he thought his wife had on the morning of her death. This was also presented as evidence that she had died before her husband left for work. Prosecution argued that Lee killed his wife and daughter in a fit of rage after learning about his wife's extramarital affair put their bodies in the bathtub filled with hot water to cause confusion in estimating the time of death, and set a slow burning fire before leaving for work. But the prosecution did not demonstrate how the accused could have made the fire burn slowly. The defense team maintained that the police were piecing together a lot of circumstantial evidence to frame him, and that his wife and daughter were alive when he left the house on the day of their murder. Court sentenced Lee to death, the maximum penalty under the law, and Lee immediately filed an appeal. The appellate court acquitted the defendant due to the absence of any direct evidence, and pointed out that the possibility of the deaths having occurred after 7 a.m. could not be ruled out, given that higher temperatures can accelerate the onset and resolution of rigor mortis. Prosecution decided to appeal to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court reversed and remanded the case for a new trial, ruling that even indirect evidence, if it is consistent with logic and empirical rule, can be used as proof of a crime, and that the overall weight of available evidence should not be discounted. The High Court declared the defendant not guilty in the new trial. For this trial, the defense team brought in Professor Thomas Crombacher, an internationally renowned Swiss forensic pathologist, to refute the basis of the prosecution's arguments. The professor testified that an accurate estimation of the time of death was impossible because the victim's rectal temperature had not been taken. Not only did the police not take postmortem rectal temperature, a gold standard test for estimating the time of death, but they also failed to take the bathtub water temperature. Well, they did conduct a temperature test of sorts by dipping a hand in the water and noting in the investigation journal that it was lukewarm. He also said that estimation of the time of death based on postmortem lividity and rigor mortis has a very wide margin of error, and accordingly, the possibility that the victims died after 7 in the morning cannot be ruled out. The defense team also had another card up its sleeve, unlike the prosecution which only used the results of a computer simulation performed by an insurance company in the United States for an entirely unrelated case. It spent a lot of money to build a real model of the bedroom and conducted experiments of setting fire to a wardrobe. Within five to six minutes of lighting the fire, a large amount of white smoke was produced, and after eight minutes, the smoke turned black and demonstrated that the smoke could be seen from outside about five minutes after the fire was set. This would mean that someone else must have set the fire after the defendant left the house. The simulated fire proved to be the game changer for the defense team, even though it was conducted outdoors in a playground, and did not match the exact conditions of the actual crime scene. At the new trial, the court accepted the professor's opinion and the results of the simulated fire and acquitted the defendant, ruling that there was no hard evidence to prove his guilt beyond reasonable doubt. Prosecution then took the case to the Supreme Court again. The Supreme Court issued the final ruling of not guilty, thus closing the case after an eight-year-long court battle. There is no direct evidence of guilt, and the most important indirect evidence, the time of death, is also inconclusive. 
the court said in its ruling, adding that, the remaining pieces of indirect evidence, taken together, cannot be considered to prove the defendant's guilt beyond reasonable doubt. After five trials over eight long years, Lee was finally acquitted of murder and arson charges. The tragic deaths of the mother and daughter continue to remain shrouded in mystery to this day. The investigation into this case was flawed from the start. First, the police made the critical mistake of not taking the temperature of the bodies of the victims and the bathtub water at the crime scene, making it impossible to determine the time of death. In the absence of any hard evidence, they should have kept an open mind, but instead zeroed in on the husband as the culprit from the beginning based on the nail marks on his arm, and were negligent in the initial inspection and investigation of the crime scene. They also failed to clip or keep the victim's nails before finding any DNA evidence from them. Another crucial detail the police failed to investigate further was the alibi of the man the victim had been having an affair with. This man told the police that he had spent the night before and the morning of the crime with one of his employees, a 21-year-old woman, which she confirmed was true. He also claimed that he bought some beer from a nearby shop, and the shopkeeper recalled that someone who looked a bit similar and may or may not have been this man did buy beer the night before the crime. The police questioned the shopkeeper eight months after the crime occurred, only at the insistence of the defense team. The man, who had also borrowed a substantial amount of money from the victim, left the country after the police initially confirmed his alibi, and his whereabouts are now unknown. After the final trial, the husband, his life utterly destroyed, started to work as a volunteer at a free clinic for foreign workers, and the identity of the real culprit still remains unknown. The victims are the only ones who know the truth, but the dead do not speak. To this day, the South Korean police seem to be firmly convinced that Lee was a culprit, who escaped justice by spending money to bring in a renowned foreign forensic pathologist, and the country's people remain divided in opinion on the identity of the murderer of this case, which came to be known as the South Korean version of the O.J. Simpson trial and a prime example of botched police investigation. So what do you think? Do you think the husband was the killer? Or perhaps the other man in the victim's life?